Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this Friday night study. Of course, it's Sabbath morning in some places. Um, and we're going to look at the book 1888 Reexamined. We're first going to look at a review of it and then start looking through a bit more of the book. We did read the preface uh, oh. to the book. So, hello. And uh, so before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for the fellowship that we can have with one another, and for the way that you teach us and instruct us. We ask, Lord, um, for forgiveness for our sins, that we can experience the joy of your salvation and the peace that you promise as we yield our hearts to you. We ask, Lord, that we can know of your love, your graciousness, your kindness, and your mercy, and that we can share these experiences with those around us. We invite your Holy Spirit to speak directly to our hearts and minds, and that as we study the history of righteousness by faith in this church, uh, that we can understand the issues uh, that are pertinent at the present time. I pray that you can be with each person, be with um, those that are struggling in various ways. You know, Lord, that um, when we accept a message of truth, not all of those around us are readily accepting that message. It can sometimes be family members, spouses, um, church members, friends, um, and other loved ones in our lives. And Lord, we need uh, your character and your patience to deal with these conflicts. We know within the movement uh, presently, uh, there's a great deal of conflict, but we know, Lord, that we can have peace as we unite with you and that as we spend time with you and following truth, that you will unite us, unite us with those of like minds. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we can be strengthened through the work that you are doing in our lives and in this movement. Be with us now as we open your word together. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, hello again, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Now, um, I know that... There is, you know, as we've talked about it, we have various um, uh, levels of understanding of this history of 1888. And I, I think that people should read uh, some of this material for themselves. Obviously, we should all read Jones and Wagner's material. Um, even some of their later material that it gets a little bit off track. We know that Wagner ends up in pantheism. Um, and it was one of the influences on Kellogg, uh, and that's when he went to England. Pantheism was sort of hip and happening uh, back in um, the 1890s in, and early 1900s in, in England. And uh, so that was an influence that came into the Adventist church through some of those connections. But even then, some of his material is important to read in spite of that. Um, there's a book called The Everlasting Covenant. And I suggest people read that book, even though it has some pantheism in it, um, because there's some important truths there. Um, and also A.T. Jones' book, um, The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, a later book of Jones, I think originally written in 1905, and it has the new view of the daily in it. Uh, but he lays out uh, the understanding of the nature of Christ quite well in that book and uh, righteousness by faith so the different people that God used they're not always um, perfect it doesn't mean they don't have imperfections just because God uses them he uses us we have imperfections in our understanding um, but uh, God has called us to share and to study and to learn and to grow so Looking back at 1888, one of the things that we saw in a book like uh, George R. Knight's that goes back and takes all the gossip 
and all and and tries to uh, understand what really happened at 1880 in 1888 by um, using the the testimonies, people's remembrances of what happened is not reliable. Uh, we see this with Froome as well. Um, you know, thinking that all of these people's opinion about what happened somehow gives us a better picture rather than accepting what Ellen White says as the primary source of understanding behind the scenes what, what was going on. It put, helps us put in context all of these uh, criticisms of Jones and Wagner as individuals, which are also rejections of a message that was being given. Um, and then, of course, we have the writings of Jones and Wagner themselves, which to me should be the primary source of understanding what the message was. So, um, but human beings like to go back and rewrite history in the way that suits our preferences. And that's not what God is asking us to do. He wants us to understand the truth. So when we look at this history, um, I'm going to read this review of Robert Whelan and Donald Short's book, 1888 Reexamined. And um, this is actually a fairly good review. It doesn't give the author's name. And this is Ministry Magazine. So I'm not really sure why the author didn't choose to uh, put his name to the article. Uh, I don't know if that's an oversight in some way. Um, so I don't know who wrote it. Um, but it is an interesting article. Okay, and it's short, it's not really long, so we're just gonna start with this. He says, you may not agree with everything in it, but this book deals with an important topic. It is a crusading book. The original edition was almost too intense to read, but the new edition speaks lovingly of wayward brethren, hopefully of an erring church, um, and thankfully of God's invitations to repent. Now, the idea that it was almost too intense to read, um, I don't know what he means by that. Now, we, I think we did look at this article uh, before a little bit, but I wanted to go through it again because uh, I can't remember if we went through the whole article. Um, but he says, mercifully, no mention is made of corporate repentance and very little of the sinful nature of Christ terms that have been stumbling blocks to many erstwhile Wheeland and short admirers. In order to understand what people say, we need to know where they're coming from. This is especially true when people say crusading things. I'm not really sure what he's talking about. He's kind of writing around at the topic, so I'm not really sure. Um, um, so he says that, um, and I, I'm not sure if he's talking about, like the, the new edition here speaks lovingly of wayward brethren. So it seems to be, uh, and he says, no mention is made of corporate repentance and very little of the sinful nature of Christ. So I'm, I'm not sure, uh, because I, I don't know if that's true about the book. Uh, seems to me that they do mention it in that book. So I'm not sure what he's trying to say there. But he says, in order to understand what people say, we need to know where they're coming from. And this is especially true when people say crusading things. So where are the authors of this crusading book coming from? Robert Whelan and Donald Short prepared the manuscript that became the original edition of the 1888 Reexamined for a review by a general conference study committee. The occasion was the, was the dismay they felt over certain features of the 1850 general conference session, which they had attended as career missionaries on furlough from Africa. What bothered them at the 1950 session was what they perceived as a contrast to what had happened in 1888 and a similarity to what happened in 1893. Wieland in particular had been immersing himself in the writings of E.J. Wagner and the sermons of A.T. Jones and digging into what Ellen White had said about Wagner's 1888 messages and about Wagner and Jones themselves. At the 1950 general conference session, Wieland in short heard a newly elected official urged the delegates to double our membership during the upcoming quadrennium and receive a, and to receive latter rain power to accomplish this worthy goal by simply believing they had received the latter rain. This sounded all too similar to what the young missionaries knew 
W.W. Prescott had urged the delegates in the 1893 session to believe. But merely believing that they had received the latter rain had not given the 1893 Adventists power to preach the loud cry. What was to enlighten the world with God's glory? Or that was to enlighten the worlds with God's glory. And the author saw no reason to expect anything different in 1950. Rather, Leland in short, urged the leaders uh, we should go back to the 1888 session. At the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference session, they said, a message was presented that Ellen White had specifically alluded to as the beginning of the loud cry of Revelation 18, verse 1 to 4, just the thing the general conference officer was looking for. She had called it the third angel's message and had pointed out that it presented justification through faith in the surety in a way that led to obedience to all of the commandments of God. It was an intensely Christ-centered message that exalted the cross and led to heartfelt repentance for sin, thus helping people meet a principal condition for receiving the latter rain. Wieland, in short, mimeographed only 17 copies of the 204-page study, intending it only for the eyes of leadership. But someone shared a copy with someone else, Soon people here, there, and everywhere were typing full-length copies for themselves and for their friends. In time, first one printer and then another distributed copies by the thousand. The circulation of the first edition of 1888 Reexamined, plus the circulation of the books written to refute it, and of news about the committees that met from time to time to discuss the situation, along with the career of Robert Brimsmead, who made his own use of 1888 re-examined, contributed so much to today's interest in 1888, it seems correct to say that Whelan and Short are responsible, more than anyone else, now living for a current interest in 1888. Now, um, I don't know if everybody knows who Robert Grimsmead is. Um, so he's, he's primarily, um, I, I'm not sure when he left the church, but... Uh, it's mostly in the 60s that we see his his work, I believe. It's before my time. Uh, and I've only read a few articles by Brimsby. Um, but he's, he's teaching uh, things quite different than Jones and Wagner. He was teaching basically a type of holy flesh. Um, but he went off into all kinds of errors. So, but at the time in, 1880, in 1988, uh, Robert Brimsmead is still a name that people uh, are talking about. Still fairly recent history. Um, Wieland and Short assert emphatically that the 1888 message is not the same message of righteousness by faith taught by Lu Luther, Wesley, and Keswick um, uh, confreres, the Keswick confreres, I'm not sure what that is, Hannah Whittle Smith, or the Victorious Life people all of which they say have been preached by Seventh-day Adventists. It cannot be so, they insist, if it is the third angel's message and combines the faith of Jesus with obedience to all the commandments of God. Now, so this is an interesting paragraph. So if we think about the 1888 message, I mean, it's the 1888 message. Now, we know that the first and second angel's messages are part of the everlasting gospel, Right. It's not just the third angel's message, as have the Adventists. But there has been this shift within Adventism. And I think, I'm not sure if uh, Whelan and Short are really responsible. I wouldn't put them as the ones responsible. But the emphasis comes upon the third angel's message as being righteousness by faith, with the ex excluding the first two as being part of it. Because of Ellen White's state, statement says that righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And, and what she means by that is not that the third angel's message is just righteousness by faith, but in verity, I think she means much more in, in a reality and experience that that's the completion of this three-step testing prophetic message of the everlasting gospel. So, but we don't see that understanding in Adventism. It's definitely something that evaded me through all the years as an Adventist until I came into this movement. 
that for the first time I realized I needed to understand the first and second. And um, so I think part of what we see with Wheeland and Short is this lack of awareness about what happens with the first and second angels messages. And you can see why that's the case. We're in the fourth generation of Adventism. We don't understand our history. We're looking back at 1888, but 1888 is the end of the first generation. And we haven't gone back to the foundation. We, we really can't understand 1888 without understanding Millerite history. So, so this is really a part of the problem is they, they don't understand the problem correctly. And uh, the solution to focus upon the third angel's message that Jones and Wagner preached, which didn't accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish. It didn't accomplish it, not because the message, even if we had the same message, it's not going to accomplish it because of the rejection of the first and second angel's messages. So that's why they have to be repeated in our history. Um, but this other idea that they're not the same. So the idea of righteousness by faith, when, when I first became an Adventist, I started reading lots of different books, um, some Adventists and some not. Now, they don't mention here, um, uh, um, what was the guy's name? Um, uh, it was on the tip of my tongue, and I can't think of it. Um, Andrew, um, can't think of it. Andrew's in the name somewhere. I um, can't remember if that's the last name. Anyway, there was there was other writers who were writing these victorious life people, right? So there's lots of them. There's lots of writers in this era, in the 1800s, 1890s, who were writing about overcoming sin. Um, and in, in some ways... So, so Wieland and Short say that they're not the same message, that 1888 message is different, and that's true, right? Um, there isn't a great emphasis in these other messages on the nature of Christ, that Christ had a fallen human nature, right? Obviously, in, in trying to understand what the victorious life is, it's definitely not connected to keeping all of the commandments of God for ones who are not uh, Adventists. And, and we know that uh, some of these teachings you don't see. You know, Wesley is probably the closest uh, to what Ellen White uh, is, is teaching, um, though uh, Methodists who come from John Wesley went to all kinds of extremes. So when you look at this paragraph here, it's it's not really telling us much, right? So if it's the third angel's message, it combines the faith of Jesus with obedience to all the commandments of God. That's not really just the only thing that's different. Um, now, another of the author's concerns is that many Adventist leaders and writers have tried to prove that 1888 was a grand triumph, that only a few leaders opposed the message and that even they soon accepted it. So this is really one of the main things that we want to understand about uh 1888 re-examined. In reply, 1888 re-examined Marshall's documentation to show that in 1902, Ellen White reported that she had been instructed that the terrible experience, not the glorious message, at the Minneapolis conference is one of the saddest chapters in the history of the believers in, and I gotta get this here. Um, for some reason, this document didn't show up properly. In present truth, elsewhere, she said that the spirit that prevailed among church leaders at the 1888 meeting was one of rejecting the message that the denominational leadership there revealed the spirit of those who drove Jesus out of Nazareth. Indeed, the spirit of Satan himself. She regret, uh, regretfully observed that some of the principal confessions made by leaders after Minneapolis were not deep enough to expunge their roots of bitterness. Here the fonts getting smaller. In the early uh, 1970s, Emmett K. Van Der Veer, Richard W. Schwartz, and I were appointed by General Conference Committee to look into the historical aspects of Wheelands and Short's positions. Uh, we concluded unanimously that though we didn't like the way these men sometimes said things, 
their analysis of history was quite accurate, but their perception of the content of the message was not as accurate. The book has its weaknesses. It is less gloomy than the first edition, but it is hardly sunny. Testimonies to ministers seem sunnier, even though it is just as serious. Um, Whelan, in short, defend Wagner and Jones too much, I think. Compared with some of the brethren, they were gentlemanly, I'm sure, but I doubt that I would have been comfortable discussing things with the sharp debater Wagner, um, who wrote the law in the book of Galatians. One inaccuracy shows up when Whelan and Short refer repeatedly to the 1888 message as the beginning of the latter reign of end of the loud cry. The loud cry is understandably a message, and there is Ellen White's authority for applying the term to the 1888 message. But I don't understand how a message could be the latter reign. In support of this concept, they only have the words of A.T. Jones. At the 1893 General Conference session, an Ellen White statement promised that the 1880 experience will sometime be seen in the true bearing with all the burden of woe that has resulted from it. Leland and Short hope that that sometime is near at hand. They hope that the revised 1888 reexamined will prove to be a contribution in due season. And, and they have a disclaimer about things. So I don't know who wrote it. And he talks about him and two other guys, Emmett A.K. Vanderveer and Richard W. Schwartz. And him, but whoever this I is, I don't know. Maybe it's the editor of Ministry Magazine who wrote this article. I'm not sure. Okay, so we can see that he says there's some truth in it about what happened. Now, as far as the message itself, his evaluation of, of the message, that it's not in line with what he understood or what he thinks Jones and Wagner actually taught, we don't know what his view is. Right. So. But for what it's worth, you know, we can see that um, people didn't try to refute uh, the message of of the book as far as uh, the history. Um, they, they accept that it's. Um, uh, you know, accurate. So you got to see what page am I on here? Okay, I don't know how I got to this page. Okay, so we had read uh, this preface, and now we're going to look at chapter one. Now, um, I'm going to skip through some things here. I'm not going to look at everything in in this book. Um, I'm trying to see. Okay, so there's the pages there. Okay, so we don't have an index here on the side. It's just seeing if I have an index. Um, okay. <laughs> so one. Why we examine our Adventist past. So in this movement, we can understand the significance of examining the past. Why do we need to examine the past? I mean, why, are we, why do we study Millerite history? Why are we studying 1888 as well? Well, we know history will repeat. Okay. We know yeah. that. Yeah, and, and those that don't know history are, are doomed to repeat it, right? So we don't yeah. want to... So we know that we need to understand what happened in the past. The issues in the past exist today, though they take on a different form, Right. I mean, for instance, in 1888, Ellen White says that the way that Jones and Wagner was, were treated was the same way that Christ was treated. Now, so we can look back at the time when Christ was crucified. We could say, well, I wouldn't have, you know, participated in crucifying Christ. Um, but our church leaders crucified Christ afresh 
in 1888. And so we can look back and we can say, well, you know, we wouldn't have done what happened in 1888 yet. Even within this movement, we've had very similar um, manifestations uh, against this message within this movement uh, that we saw happening in 1888, right? Same type of things where, you know, mocking occurs and all that kind of stuff, which should never have be a part of, of our message. Should never treat a person the way that Jones and Wagner were treated. And yet those things still exist within our movement. Because when people are faced with something that's true, um, if you're faced with error, it's easy to refute it. You just present the truth. But you're, when you're faced with truth that you reject, the only thing you have at your disposal is misrepresentation and um, attacking the messenger, right? So you misrepresent the message that's being presented and you have to um, attack the person's character or something about, about the person because you don't have truth on your side, right? So it, it's always easy to know when you have truth on your side. Um, it's it's simple. You just present truth. You, you don't have to um, say anything about that person. But if you don't have truth on your side, it it lessens um, your ability to to challenge it because it's truth. You're not you don't believe the truth. If you want to attack it, well, attack the messenger or misrepresent what they're saying, which is kind of like attacking the messenger as well. So, so we know that we need to understand our past, path, past. Um, um, so he's going to go through some of these things. These are pretty obvious things of why we need to understand uh, what we believe. But the other point here, um, and I'm going to be sort of picking through this, um, that we need to understand that truth can doesn't lose anything by closer closer examination, right? So if what we're teaching is true, we should always be willing to examine it and have others examine, it, right? Um, so this this is an important point. So we're going to present something that's true. Um, let people examine it. Now, when people don't want to exam examine something to see whether it's true or not, that is a danger. And so we can we can see that in the past, this is something that continues to happen in the past and continues to happen in the present, and will happen in the future. So Ellen White says, um, December 20th, 1892, no true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. We are living in perilous times, and it does not become us to accept everything claimed to be truth without examining it thoroughly. Neither can we afford to reject anything that bears the fruits, fruits of the Spirit of God. But we should be teachable, meek, and lowly of heart. The Lord designs that our opinions be put to the test. And some people don't want to have their opinions put to the test. They don't want them to be examined. And and that's a danger. If God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when we shall be brought before councils and before thousands for his namesake, and each one will have to give the reasons of his faith. Then will come the severest criticism upon every position that has been taken for the truth. So if we believe something to be true, we know that we need it to be examined. And one is because it's going to be examined at some time in the future. And so when, when we study something, we want to bring ourselves as many arguments against what it is that we believe, what our opinions, our understanding is, um, so that we will be prepared. One reason is so we will be prepared to, to defend it. But the other thing is we also need to know whether it is true or not. And so if I, you know, let's say I believe something like the 2520, and if I, if I don't understand anything about the chronology of the 2520, obviously 
somebody's going to come along and say, you know, nothing happened in 677. And if I haven't studied that, I might not know how to defend that. But the other thing is, I need to know for certainty that it is true for me to have faith and confidence in it. So I need, need to study. We need to have what we believe based upon reality. And if I make up things um, just to support what I believe, even if what I believe is truth, but I have false arguments to support it, then when those are examined, it'll be seen that my belief is based upon a faulty foundation. So it's important to have a solid foundation in what we believe. Now, of course, when it comes to something like the 1888 message, um, the, the main issue here is uh, the rejection of light, right? That has occurred in the past. And that is going to occur again in our time. So Ellen White says, um, uh, letter September 1st, 1892, uh, the sin committed in what took place at Minneapolis remains on the record books of heaven, registered against the names of those who resisted light. And it will remain upon the record until full confession is made and the transgressors stand in full humility before God. Now, if we have rejected light, we need to make full connect confession, especially in acting the way that they did in rejection of that message. Because it wasn't just that they intellectually had this resistance to light. Um, their characters manifested in resistance to Jones and Wagner's messages were satanic in origin. Um, now, one of the things that we as a movement understand, we know that there's the message of righteousness by faith. And we know the reason it did not accomplish its work is because the first and second angels' messages were rejected. They need to be repeated. And that's our history. So the first and second messages are repeated so that they, the second message can come in and empower the third angels' message. That's Revelation 18, the Sunday law, right? The history that we're in presently. Um, so in order to receive the third angel's message, it's not just a, a full confession of, and this of course is dealing with the people involved themselves, but for us individually in rejecting light, full confession would be an understanding of all of the light we have rejected, not just some of it. And as a church, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have rejected a great deal of light and aren't even aware that that light exists. That is, it's already built into our DNA as Seventh-day Adventists. We believe certain things about our history that aren't true. And I see these things constantly reiterated. Um, things like the 70 weeks, you know, it should start with Cyrus's decree. We're all wrong in choosing Artaxerxes' decree. Um, things like that, that exist within uh, Adventist thought, that there's no foundation for our prophetic structure, our prophetic message. Um, the belief, and I've run into this with conservative Adventists who don't believe in uh, August 11th, 1840 is the fulfillment of uh, the end of the second woe, right? Um, so, so conservative Adventists can reject a lot of truth and still start, still, still be preaching, you know, the 1888 message in their minds. Uh, but really, they, they've rejected so much light that this message is completely impotent. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm just reading these Ellen White quotes. We should be the last people on earth to indulge in the slightest degree the spirit of persecution against those who are bearing the message of God to the world. This is the most terrible feature of unchrist likeness that has been manifested itself, that has manifested itself among us since the Minneapolis meeting. Sometime it will be seen in its true bearing with all the burden of woe that has resulted from it. And when we think about this, the most terrible free feature of unchristlikeness that has been manifested among us 
This is true today. To, to misrepresent people's characters, to mock them, uh, to attack them, um, instead of actually sitting down and following the council to study with people who have differences of, of view, of understanding things, um, to study them out, to see whether what they say is true or not, and, and to do this in a way that is, is winning, right? If that person is believing error, we should seek to win them. We shouldn't be shunning them and casting them out. Um, now, this is um, O.A. Olson. Uh, this is a quote from him, not from uh, Ellen White. Um, so he says, a former president of the General Conference also recognized that this issue of 1888 must remain a perennial test among us until at last we do fully overcome. He says, some may feel tried over the idea that Minneapolis is referred to in these meetings, 1893. I know that some have felt grieved and tried over an allusion to that meeting, grieved and tried, right? So in 1893, Jones, of course, is referring back to 1888. And some people are upset about this. Their feelings are being hurt. Um, but let it be borne in mind that the reason why anyone should feel so is an unyielding spirit on his part. Just as quickly as we fully surrender and humble our hearts before God, the difficulty is all gone. The very idea that one is grieved shows at once the seed of rebellion in the heart. If we fail at one time, the Lord will take us over the ground again. And if we fail a second time, he will take us over the ground again. And if we fail a third time, the Lord will take us over the same ground again. Instead of being vexed over the idea that the Lord is taking us over the same ground, let us thank him and praise him unceasingly, for this is God's mercy and compassion. Anything else than this is our ruin and destruction. So. I mean, we can apply this, of course, to the 1888 message, but it's it's to all light. You know, if we are so grieved and offended uh, that we can't take the time to to examine things and and see where we may be in error, we're just doing the same things that happened in 1888 and that happened at the cross. <clears throat> um Um, so this is uh, A.T. Jones from the 1893 uh, General Conference Bulletin. We've read this before. Um, but O.A. O. A. Olson was one of the speakers at that time, too. So this is uh, from Jones, uh, page 185. The other one was 188. So uh, there will be things to come that will be more surprising than that was uh, to those at Minneapolis. More surprising than anything we have yet seen. And brethren, we will be required to receive and preach that truth. But unless you and I have every fiber of that spirit rooted out of our hearts, we will treat that message and the messenger by whom it is sent as God has declared we have treated this other 1888 message, right? So one of the things that Jones is saying here and that Olson is referring to as well is if we have rejected the 1888 message, message and we don't repent of that any following message we will not receive as well right and so we can see if we take what Olson is saying and we take him what Jones is saying we understand what this movement uh, believes regarding the repetition of the first and second angels messages in our history the parable of the ten virgins being repeated to the very letter Parable of the Ten Virgins is the first and second angels' messages. And that God brings not just individuals, but he's brought this church over the same ground. And it's going, it rejects it again, right? This, this message, the first and second angels' message, when they're presented, uh, the church is rejecting them in that history. Now, we know that those messages are going to come to Seventh-day Adventists, what we call Levites. Right. So it bypasses the priests 
because they've rejected that message. But to the common Adventist member who accepts the messages of the first and second angel's message, they then will be able to receive the third angel's message. So this is an important reason for us to understand this history. Not just the history of 1888, but also the history of um, uh, Millerites, right? The first and second angels' messages. So we need to understand the first, second, and third angels' messages. Um, Now, so I don't agree, agree with Jones, uh, Jones with uh, a Whelan in short in their ass assessment completely of the problem. That is, they leave out the first and second angels' messages. They don't really understand uh, what's involved, why the third angel's message uh, was so, um, so unwelcome. Now, um, so this is an important chapter here too. And, and they kind of touch on it, but they don't, I think, fully understand this problem. And, and this is part of their problem is the same problem the church has in understanding this history. So we're going to read this uh, through. Uh, no one can question the genuineness of the spiritual experience of those who passed through the 1844 movement, right? So here he's referring back to the 1844 movement. That's really the first and second angels' messages. So at least he, he focused back that there was this movement. It was genuine. It was a genuine spiritual experience. No one can question the genuineness of it. Jesus was precious to the believers who looked for his soon coming, and their hearts were united in deep, sincere devotion. They recognized the Holy Spirit as unmistakably present in that movement. It was this conviction, transcending mere reliance on theological correctness, that held the confidence of the little flock through the great disappointment. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was conceived in an experience of genuine love and was born in a travail of soul by those few who risked everything in their recognition of a genuine work, uh, on their recognition of a genuine work of the Holy Spirit. Thus, she was well-born, conceived in true faith, and not in legalism. In her early years, she loved the Lord with a true heart and appreciated the presence of the Holy Spirit. Her later difficulties stem from a traffic, tragic leaving of that first love and a consequent failure to recognize the true Holy Spirit. So this leaving of the first love, that we know that this is, uh, where does this expression come from? Uh, one of the seven churches. Okay, so which church? Um, let's see. It's love. I think it's uh, uh, Thyatira. Okay, so Thyatira. The first church, Ephesus. Oh, Ephesus, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. So so Thyatira is going to be the fourth church. That's going to be the period of the, of the 1260 years. Um, yeah. But yeah, the one that leaves its first love is right after, you know, the, the the cross and all of those things. That church leaves its first love. So, um, so if we one thing that we can do is we can take the messages of the seven churches and we can apply them to our history. So even though we're in the time of the Laodicean Church. You can take Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, um, Sardis, uh, um, uh, Philadelphia, and uh, um, Laodicea and place them in our history from 1844 to the Second Coming, right? Now, in Jeff's articles that he's recently been writing, he's going to talk about how the seven churches, uh, the, the the one church, um, Philadelphia, is going to be the eighth church, that we have to be Philadelphians. And this is something that I reject. I don't think that you can find this in the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, that, that one of the churches is resurrected and becomes the eighth church. 
we are Laodiceans to the end. What's important is that there's messages that are given that, that match certain spiritual conditions or problems within the church. That is, the message addresses a specific spiritual um, error, I guess. Can't think of a better word. Condition, spiritual condition. Um, so we know that the Philadelphia church, that's going to be August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, at least somewhere in that history. We can say that it's the messages to the church of Philadelphia. That is a church that has no rebuke. Um, but we can also place that in our history. Right, because that's going to be the history of this movement when it's it has that spirit. And, and we can see that, that that's probably going to be November 9th, 2019 to July 18, uh, 2020. You know, we can put that there. And then after that, we relay it to scenes, right, within this movement itself, within Adventism. So, so within the Laodicean church, Seventh-day Adventist church, you can still place those seven churches. You're just not going to have um, this idea that we have to end up as Philadelphians. You know, we are Laodiceans. And, and that's the message that we need to hear. So, but here we can see after 1844, they've lost their first love. Right now he says, um, now he's talking about when he talks about her, he's talking about the church or the movement. Um, so they leave their first love and a consequent failure to recognize the true Holy Spirit. In early 1850, this warmth of devotion for Jesus began to be gradually replaced in the hearts of many by a, by a stupid and dormant, half-awake condition, according to the young messenger of the Lord. An insidious love of self began to replace the true love for the Savior, producing lukewarmness, pride, and complacency in possessing a system of truth, uh, gradually crowded out much of the simple, heartfelt faith in Jesus, would let, which led to its acceptance originally. Um, I'm just making it bigger there. Uh, thus, soon after the great disappointment in 1844 and the gathering of the little flock who held their faith, there developed a deficiency in their understanding of the import of the three angels' messages. The deficiency was not theological, but spiritual. The church was like an adolescent who grows physically but remains a child otherwise. The truth made phenomenal progress and was found invincible in debate. But the servants of the Lord have trusted too much in the strength of argument, said Ellen White in 1855. This made it difficult for them to resist the unconscious but subtle temptation to indulge in spiritual pride had they not accepted had they not seen and accepted truth and sacrificed for it there seemed to be a merit in such sacrifice ministers and evangelists would pitch their tent in a new community stir up the other ministers and the popular churches win the arguments and debates gather out their best members baptize them raise up a new church and move on to more victories almost everywhere they there enjoyed uh, uh, there enjoyed a euphoria of success. Um, opposition led them to cherish the hope of personal or corporate vindication at the second advent more than love's anticipation of meeting the beloved, whether such a meeting included vindication or not. Now, when we think about this personal and corporate vindication, uh, this is something that is, I think, the inheritance of Adventism. Can people agree with me that Adventists want to be seen or vindicated before the world? This is what led to uh, the meetings in the 1950s with the evangelicals. This is what led uh, to this movement wanting to be vindicated with the July 18, 2020 prediction. People, and I understand the feeling of it, 
I mean, wanting to be personally vindicated. Um, nobody likes to be criticized um, and, you know, cast out and mocked and so forth. But we can never have that as a motivation for our actions. Now, Christ, the vindication of Christ, how is Christ's character vindicated? Is it going to be vindicated through argument? Because Christ's character does need to be vindicated. How does Christ vindicate his character? But through us, through his, okay. through his church. Right, so he's going to do it through his church. Now, the thing is, Christ does it first in his own being, because really the cross is a vindication of God's character. But the power of the cross is that it can reproduce in others that same character. And that is the vindication of Christ's work. It's a vindication of the character of God. But if we're interested in our personal or corporate vindication, and sometimes we can, we can uh, disguise that um, as you know, a vindication of God's character. But we saw quite clearly that people were so disappointed with July 18th that many people were embarrassed because we failed in our prediction and felt that they could no longer uh, have influence with any of their friends that they had been preaching to about what's going to happen on July 18th. And, and that was one of the reasons they rejected July 18th after the disappointment is, you know, I'm embarrassed, right? They were looking for personal vindication. And that's the type of shortcut. It's like winning the spiritual lottery. You know, if those events had occurred, you know, the idea is that everybody would then listen to us. It would be so easy. But that's not the way of the cross. In order to vindicate God's character, we need the cross. We need that self-sacrificing spirit. We need to represent him in character. And that's why this message of righteousness by faith, properly understood and placed within both all three messages, is essential for uh, our spiritual growth, our understanding, and our power uh, to live the Christian life. So... So opposition led them to cherish the hope of personal or corporate vindication at the second advent more than love's anticipation of meeting the beloved. So people were looking for vindication, whether such a meeting included vindication or not, right? So that, you know, their faith became to them more an act of belief in doctrinal truth and obedience to it, motivated by a self-oriented concern for reward rather than a heartfelt appreciation of the grace of Christ. Instead of walking humbly in utter dependence on the Lord, we began to walk proudly with our indisputable doctrinal evidence of the truth. We're no different than the Jews were in the time of Christ. This is the character that was manifested in the time of Christ with his church. <clears throat> Now, he says here, the result was inevitably a form of legalism. The same experience has been repeated often in the individual lives of new Adventist converts. Rightly understood, the history of the Advent movement is the story of our own individual hearts. Each of us is a microcosm of the whole, as each drop of water embodies the essence of the rain. In all that we say about the experience of past years, we remember that we are no better than our forefathers. As Paul informed the believers at Rome, we do the same things. Only through an insight which recognizes corporate guilt can the failures of our denominational history be resolved with positive, encouraging value. Now here he's going to talk about corporate guilt and corporate repentance. And this is the part that I really think that Whelan and Short uh, go astray because they believe that the church is going to have to repent in order for Christ's work to be finished on earth. And really, 
The only type of guilt that exists is individual guilt. There is no such thing as corporate guilt. Individuals sin. Corporations do not. Right? Now, it is true that there is a church, and we can talk about the church, and we say, well, that's a corporate. Now, corporate has to do with the body, right? So somebody could argue, well, this is just the guilt of the body. The body of Christ needs to repent. Right? But when they're talking about corporate guilt here, they tend to place the focus upon the leadership of the church and not really the body. Right? So so we will look into some of those ideas here. Uh, It's not so much to be a critique of Joan, of uh, Whelan and Short's understanding, but uh, there are some things here that are quite true. So we know that uh, the experience that the church has this seed that they plant in those that are converts. And we can see this in our evangelistic efforts, in the way that they are conducted. What do they appeal to? They appeal to the ego of the people they're bringing into the church. Right? I mean, I don't know how it is today. I haven't been to a recent evangelistic series. But... Uh, they appeal to the ego. How is that? How do they appeal to the ego? In your experience of, at evangelistic series. You become a Seventh-day Adventist. What do you have? What, what do you gain by becoming a Seventh-day Adventist? in evangelistic series what are they presenting be a member of the church a member of the body well you're going to have this special so, knowledge that you know your neighbor doesn't have you're part of this special exclusive group right yeah yeah we'll appeal to that yeah. yeah and and so they appeal to the ego um to bring people in they manipulate them and at least it's been my experience in the evangelistic series I've been to. And I've seen the members who have come in. They have this spiritual pride. Right? They haven't given them the gospel. They haven't shown them truly that they're a sinner. There's some lip service to it. Um, but it's really about accepting doctrines, not about seeing yourself as a sinner. Right. Now, there's probably different evangelists who do it differently. Um, there might be some who really appeal to the true gospel. But when I went to evangelistic series, I was already converted. And I could see through the evangelistic series. I, I thought I wouldn't have become an Adventist if I had gone to this series of meetings. It wouldn't have appealed to me because I wasn't interested in my ego. I was actually interested in not being a sinner anymore. That was you know, my goal in coming to Christ, to see myself as a sinner, to overcome sin. Um, so so this is part of the problem that we have. Um, <clears throat> so when we deal with this l- lukewarmness, so Ellen White says, you know, we lost our first love, right? That's that's the the problem. The question is, what was this first love that we lost? Now, he keeps talking about the true Holy Spirit. Um, And and I'm not sure what he means by that. Um, I mean, I think partly they just don't see the true Christ. They don't see the true gospel. Um, But anyway, um, that's so he's going to talk about how he believes that lukewarmness took root. And, and I would think that there's, I would have some differences. I agree with some of what he says. Um, um, but here are some statements from Spirit of Prophecy. We have been so united with the world that we have lost sight of the cross and do not suffer for Christ's sake. In the acceptance of the cross, we are distinct. In acceptance of the cross, we are distinguished from the world. And then she wrote uh, as well, there's too much bustle and stir about our religion while Calvary and the cross are forgotten. Now, 
what, what has happened in Adventism in, to counteract this isn't really any better, right? So we can take what Ellen White says here. And we can say, well, you know, the problem was too much bustle and stir about our religion. Well, let's focus upon the cross, right? We're going to talk about Christ and his love. Um, so you saw a movement away from sort of doctrinal things to the small point. Love gospel, uh, especially in the 80s, uh, probably in the 70s. Um, but it's just going from one ditch into another. Because can we appreciate, appreciate the cross without understanding prophecy, without understanding um, God's law, right? If we just see the cross as, you know, God giving us a buy, you know, we don't have to actually keep those commandments, uh, then that's not really truly the cross. And also the cross is, uh, we, we need to suffer for Christ's sake. Now, Whelan writes a really good book called In Search of the Cross. Uh, where he clearly illustrates that the cross is about us taking up our own cross, that we carry this cross that Christ has first borne for us. So, so Whelan has a good understanding of the cross, in my estimation. Uh, but often what ends up happening is people go from one ditch into the other. Whelan doesn't do that. Um, I'm not going to go through this section. Um, so we know that the church had all of this um, growth um, as an institution, but didn't have the spirit of Christ. So this is from Manuscript 2, 1890. The priest took the infant Jesus in his arms, but he could see nothing there. God did not speak to him and say, this is the consolation of Israel. But just as soon as Simeon came in, he sees there that th that little infant in his mother's arms. God says to him, this is the consolation of Israel. Here was one who recognized him because he was where he could discern spiritual things. We have not a doubt, but that the Lord was with Elder Wagner as he spoke yesterday. The question is, has God sent the truth? As God raised up these men to proclaim the truth, I say, yes, God has sent men to bring us the truth that we should not have had unless God had sent somebody to bring it to us. I accept it, and I no more dare to lift my hand against these persons than against Jesus Christ, who is to be recognized in his messengers. We have been in perplexity, and we have been in doubt. And the churches are ready to die. But now here we read and quotes Revelation 18, verse 1, right? So Revelation 18, verse 1, as we know, is, And after these things I saw another angel come down from him, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So Ellen White is recognizing that Revelation 18 is being fulfilled in that history. Mighty angel is coming down. Second angel's message is joining with the third, third angel's message. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, so one of the things I know when we have uh, Bible studies in my home back when I first became an Adventist, in reading um, Ellen White and what she was saying about the work at the end of the world is that um, God would take the work into his own hands, that the machinery, all of this structure that had been put in place in the building up of the church was not how the gospel was going to be ultimately given to the world. So the organization itself was going to reject the truth and the grassroots of Adventism would be uh, the ones to give this message. And that makes lots of sense in the context of uh, a denomination can't exist if it's going to be made illegal 
by the state, persecuted by the state. Um, um, so, so this was happening in the early days of the church after they had organized. So she says, um, 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 so the church was ready to die. So I'm just trying to find here where she's going to be speaking. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. Maybe I'll just read these final, our problem today. I'll just read what he says. A century later, with more ponderous worldwide machinery of organization, the difficulty of rectifying the same lukewarm, ready-to-die condition appears even more perplexing than it was in 1890. Denominational pride and lukewarmness in many nations and cultures present a staggering problem. It can no longer be hoped that mere passage of time will provide a remedy. Um, even God's patience may soon be at an end. The effects of our lukewarmness will not, cannot, be tolerated by the Lord himself forever. It is he who says that we make him so sick that he feels like throwing up. This is what the original language implies in Revelation 3, verse 16 and 17. The key to understanding our present baffling position lies in a true appraisal of what happened at the 1888 session and its aftermath. We must uh, uh, recognize the reality of its spiritual fallout in our denominational character worldwide today. The latter rain and the loud cry began among us as a simple, unspectacular message of miraculous power. But these priceless blessings were shut off because the Holy Spirit was insulted. Now, when we think about this here, he had talked earlier about how the th three angels' messages were rejected in losing their first love, right? So if we go back to the beginning of this section, um, right, he's going to say, um, right, um, Where's this here where we read this? Right, so it's in this section. Thus, soon after the great disappointment of 1844 and the gathering of the little flock who held their faith, there developed a deficiency in their understanding of the import of the three angels' messages. Now, this is something that he puts there, but he never really expands upon because he focuses upon the third angel's message as he sees it as being righteousness by faith and doesn't focus upon uh, the third angel's message. So if he had said what our problem is today, if he had said, not only do we need to understand the third angel's message, we need to understand its connection to the first and second angel's messages, and that we have rejected all three messages. But that's not something that we understand in the 1980s and the 1990s. It's not going to be something that we understand until after the fall of the Soviet Union, when God gives this light to Elder Jeff regarding uh, the parallel to Millerite history. So, so his assessment of the problem is partial. Definitely, we rejected the third angel's message. But we also have rejected the first two messages. Um, now, we read 18, uh, the 1893 General Conference Bulletin articles by Jones as well as 1895. And um, so we know that this, the beginning of the loud cry in the latter rain that happens with this message in Minneapolis. But we also know that it happens in our history at 9-11, right? So that's when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down for our history. Um, for decades preceding 1888, the church and its leadership looked forward to the times of refreshing when the long-expected latter rain would come. This was a cherished expectation among us a century ago, like the long-awaited coming of the Messiah was to, to the Jews in John the Baptist's time. And this is an important point. Um, when I first uh, became an Adventist and I began studying, 
uh, one of the early things that we studied in our upper room Bible studies in my house uh, was the latter rain. So we made a book. Uh, it was called, um, trying to think of the title of the book. Um, but it was anyway dealing with the latter rain. It was one of the guys who had been um, the head of the E.G. White Estates. I can't think of his name. Olson is his last name, but I can't remember his first name. Um, I think it was Preparing for the Latter Rain. I think it was the title of the book. It was just a, a stapled book. It was, you know, printed out and it was in an orange cover and uh, just a very cheap copy of the book, but was very uh, powerful. It was mostly spirit of prophecy statements. And, and so we know that we were praying in our upper room Bible studies back in the 1980s for the outpouring of the latter rain. Um, and I believe that those prayers have been answered, right? So this would have been in, you know, 85, 86. And um, <clears throat> then I moved, but uh, the study sort of continued there for a while. Um, but this was something that was really foundational to me as a young Adventist, understanding about the latter rain. And so we've always been looking for this latter rain. Now, in the criticism of this, this guy says, well, you know, the latter rain can't be a message from the review that we read. And you know, he sort of says, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Obviously, the loud cry is a message, but how can the latter rain be a message? Didn't really make sense what the guy was saying. Um, so what he says is few seem to recognize that the latter rain and the loud cry would be primarily a clear understanding of the gospel. The loud cry was expected to be increased noise. It took us by surprise that it turned out to be increased light. Now, now when we say it's a clear understanding of the gospel, that's true. But we know that the everlasting gospel, as we now understand it, is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. That if we just think that the third angel's message is the everlasting gospel or it's the righteousness by faith. Again, you know, I keep emphasizing this point because he's missing it, right? Um, but it's true. But if you, if you think about this book being written before November 9th, 1989, uh, before the time of the end, um, it is still a message that is is needed to prepare for that light that's going to come in this movement. Um, but there's this lack of, of recognition of what the real problem is. So, so we have an increase of light. But it's a clear understanding of the gospel. It's a clear understanding of Millerite history. So he says, we expected a thunderous shaking of the earth with the message, get ready or else. And we're not prepared for the still small voice of a revelation of grace as the true motivation of the third angel's message. The supernatural power we hoped for must be consequent on our accepting the greater gospel light that must lighten the earth with glory. This is true, but he doesn't fully understand what that is. Now, there's another part here that... Um, you know, so this supernatural power we hope for. So what people are looking for, what what were people looking for on November 9th, 2019, for instance? Many people in this movement were believing that somehow they weren't going to sin anymore, right? Um, that somehow if they could stop sinning before November 9th, 2019, then they wouldn't have to worry about it that after November 9th, 2019. Then they right? rush to get baptized, too. Right. So it's kind of like if, if we can get in, in that door before it closes, then, then we're secure, right? Now, this is sort of this inheritance of this idea. So we know that we get supernatural power, but this supernatural power is a message. It's not something magical that comes upon us. It, it's an experience as well. 
but it is a message. It's a message that's experienced. And what we had in this movement was a repetition of the first and second angels' messages, which was to be an experience that would parallel the experience of the Millerites and prepare us uh, to receive greater light. And that greater light is the light about our about Christ's character and our characters and what Christ wants to do in our lives. So, so there's a truth here, but there's pieces missing to this puzzle. Um, so it says here, there was a terrible danger that Jewish leaders might reject their Messiah when he should come suddenly. And there was an equal danger that the responsible leaders of our church might spurn the loud cry when it should begin. As far back as 1882, Ellen White had warned that they might someday be unable to recognize the true Holy Spirit. Many of you cannot discern the work and presence of God. There are men among us in responsible positions who hold that such a faith as that of Paul, Peter, or John is old-fashioned and insufferable at the present time. It is pronounced absurd, mystical, and unworthy of an intelligent mind. Now, my wife and I are reading five testimonies. We've read this section already. These are mostly through five testimonies. Um, and uh, so the context there is that what's happening in Adventism in that period of time in the 1880s um, is people are becoming more sophisticated, right? Um, and trying to look at the truths of the Bible, not as old fashioned farmers and and laborers, but sort of as, as intellectuals, right? And and so this this was happening within Christianity, within Protestantism, and within Adventism. Um, those who have trusted to intellect, genius, or talent will not then stand at the head of rank and file. They did not keep pace with the light. Those who have proved themselves unfaithful will not then be entrusted with the flock. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. Right. Great men in the world's eyes, right? Obviously, in we have to re represent Christ in character. When we have men as devoted as Elijah and possessing the faith which he possessed, we shall see that God will reveal himself to us as he did to holy men of old. When we have men who, while they acknowledge their deficiencies, plead with God in earnest faith as did Jacob we shall see the same results right so people want some something magical to happen so that they can do this work but it's it's through accepting the light that God gives us that we are then enabled to do this work um, so he says specifically the general conference president in 1885 was warned that unless he and some others are, and this is quoting Ellen White, aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning, the workers will be surprised by the simple means that he, Christ, will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. And this is something that struck me back in the 1980s, this statement. Um, so that was addressed to J.I. Butler and, S and ha Stephen Haskell, right? Um, now Haskell heeded the warning and was one of the few who had the discernment to recognize the mysterious thing that was happening before his eyes three years later. But not Butler and many others. The Lord would be forced in 1888 to pass by experienced ministers to use younger or more obscure agents. The Lord often works where we least expect him. He surprises us by revealing his power through instruments of his own choice. While he passes by the men to whom we have looked as those through whom light should come, 
Many will reject the very messages God sends to his people if these led, leading brethren do not accept them, right? So if God gives messages and the leading brethren don't accept them, they're going to reject them, right? Even if all our leading men should refuse light and truth, that door will still remain open. The Lord will raise up men who will give the people the message for this time. It may be under a rough and uninviting exterior. Uh, the pure brightness of a genuine Christian character will be revealed. Elijah took Elisha from the plow and threw upon him the mantle of consecration. The call to this great and solemn work was presented to men of learning and position. Had these men been little in their own eyes and trusted fully in the Lord, he would have honored them with bearing his standard in triumph to the victory. God will work a work in our day that but few anticipate. He will raise up and exalt among us those who are taught rather by the unction of his spirit than by the outward training of scientific institutions. Now, one of the things about this that I've always considered is I have seen people who, well, they describe, you could call them rough and uninviting, um, but they also don't have a genuine Christian character. And they may not be learned, and they think somehow that that qualifies them uh, to be God's messengers. So, so we shouldn't take, you know, the idea that, well, just some, you know, because we're uneducated and we have a rough and uninviting exterior, that God is using us, right? There is to be a work that's done on the human heart. And I've seen some of these people who think that they have the unction of his spirit. And, and they're not, they don't have this outward training of scientific institutions. Um, but they don't have the unction of his spirit, right? So that unction is not something that you can proclaim upon yourself. You can't say, I have the unction of God's spirit and, and I'm the messenger, right? God is going to use whoever he chooses to use. Our responsibility is to study and to do the work that's before us. But who God chooses to do that work, that's up to God. And that unction comes from God, not from man. <clears throat> um, now, in that very year, 1882, E.J. Wagner began a course of training that was evidently under the special guidance of the Holy Spirit. He was being prepared to be the agent of a special work. Now, it is interesting because remember the review I read at the beginning. Um, this guy believed, whoever he was, that uh, uh, Wheeland and Short are defending the characters of Wagner and Jones more than they should, right? Because this guy has a critical attitude about Jones and Wagner, their characters. But were Jones and Wagner anything other than rough and inviting exteriors. Did they have anything other than that? I mean, from a human point of view, God doesn't choose the most eloquent, the most pleasant people to listen to. Jones and Wagner's had their defects in how they did things, but they were God's instruments. Right? So, now why does God allow, why does he choose people who have appearances defects in in their their mannerisms and so forth why does god allow that why doesn't he he find the most polished and um eloquent congenial whatever type of of messengers why does he choose these rough characters because definitely jones is a rough character Couldn't he find the most charismatic individuals? There's there's a couple of reasons. Anybody know what those reasons are? What was that again? 
Well, why is God choosing people that have these characters that are rough? Right? Doesn't mean they're not Christ-like in some ways, but they have these rough exteriors. Why does God choose them and not like the most charismatic and eloquent to be his messengers? Why does he choose these people with, you know, a few rough edges? I think they'd be more apt to listen. Listen. Okay. Well, um, since, well, I, I don't know. Okay. So you're saying that the person with rough edges is more, is more apt to listen than someone apt to listen. Just, yeah. I think I think so. Okay. Um, could be wrong. Could be wrong. Well, okay. So, what about the acceptance of of other people? What is it that we are to accept? Are we going to follow men or God? So, if you had somebody who's um, so charismatic, and and we see these types of people in the popular churches, um. They can get up a huge following. We were looking at one video on YouTube of this guy. He has 100,000 church members. He's very charismatic, really good speaker. Teaches some truth, but lots of error mixed with it. Um, he seems a little bit arrogant. Um, so in order to have individuals who... First, the individual needs to depend upon God. They need to see themselves as sinners. Um, but also the people, we're not following people. Jones and Wagner were not worshipped. Ellen White was the weakest of the weak, a woman, a sickly woman. Because we're not following men, we're following God. God has his messengers. And we need to accept the message that they have get, given and accept the messenger in spite of the fact that that messenger may have things that we can criticize, right? Having things that we can criticize can give excuses for people rejecting the message. He doesn't speak well. He He's a little bit, you know, I don't like his character, um, whatever it is, right? But what we have to do is listen to the message. And so Jones and Wagner gave a message. Did they have problems? Was Jones a little bit cocky sometimes? Was he a bit argumentative? Yes. Uh, but that wasn't a reason to reject the message. If we in good company, I mean, they said the same thing about Jesus. How does this man know anything having not learned letters? Yeah. So the thing is, is the message true? And that's what we always have to ask ourselves. And, and God doesn't want to have his, um, his messengers worshipped, put on a pedestal. The focus has to be upon the message, not the messengers. I mean, we may appreciate, appreciate a messenger because he gives a good message. But if, if we put that messenger over the message itself and just accept whatever he says because we like him, we like the way he speaks or whatever, uh, that's a danger. So God chooses those that uh, that man would not choose to be his messengers. <clears throat> um, now, um, this is now this um, passage here. We're going to stop with this. Um, this is um, written by E.J. Wagner. It's what I call his deathbed confession, uh, May 16th, 1916. Um, and, and so they've taken this statement kind of out of its con context uh, because he's actually in this document rejecting Adventism. But he does go back to his, his origins. I began my real study of the Bible 34 years ago in 1882. At that time, Christ was set forth before my eyes, evidently crucified for me. I was sitting a little apart from the body of the congregation in the large tent at a camp meeting in Healdsburg, California, one gloomy, gloomy Sabbath afternoon. I have no idea what was the subject of the discourse, not a word nor a text have I ever known. All that has remained with me was that I saw was what I saw. Suddenly a light shone around me, and the tent was, for me, far more brilliantly lighted. 
than if the noonday sun had been shining and I saw Christ hanging on the cross, crucified for me. In that moment, I had my, my first positive knowledge, which came like an overwhelming flood, that God loved me and that Christ died for me. God and I were the only beings I was conscious of in the universe. I knew then, by actual sight, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. I was the whole day with all its, it, what? I was the whole world with all its sin. I'm sure that Paul's experience on the way to Damascus was no more real than mine. I resolved at once that I would study the Bible in the light of that revelation, in order that I might help others to see the same truth. I've always believed that every part of the Bible must be set forth with more or less vividness for that glorious revelation. Christ crucified. So, um, so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna leave there. We're gonna come back to some of this stuff again next week. Um, any thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear gracious heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the Sabbath and for the blessings of fellowship. And we just pray that you can be with each of us as we um, as we come close to you. We ask that we can see Christ evidently crucified for us. We know, Lord, that you love us, but we have so many ideas uh, in our minds, in our understanding, that have hindered our walk with you. And we just pray, Lord, that you can reveal yourselves, yourself to us. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them and help us to enjoy the blessings of this day. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name.